All right, so I have 602. Um, I will kick us off for the webinar. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm really, really glad to have um, everyone on tonight to join us for um, the November 29th SSAT webinar discussing developments and optimization of collaborative relationships with industry. Uh, I'm really excited about this topic. I think it's a um, topic that we are not very um, robustly educated on during training. And so we have three experts with us today to discuss their experiences. Um, so the webinar is going to discuss some of the avenues, challenges, and ethics behind collaborative relationships between industry and um, how this can integrate with clinical practice for the benefit both for our research and for our patients. Um, and without further ado, um, so we have three speakers tonight. I'm going to lead off with our first speaker introduction. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Shrona Ross. Uh, she's an advanced foregut and hepatobiliary surgeon specializing in robotic and single incision laparoscopic operations. She's a professor of surgery at the University of Central Florida College of Medicine, where she holds numerous roles, including director of minimally invasive surgery and surgical endoscopy at the Florida Hospital and co-director of the Advanced GI and Hepatobiliary Surgery Fellowship at the Digestive Health Institute. She's an active member of the SSAT and serves on a multitude of national committees, including SAGES, ACS, SSAT, HPBA, Society of Robotic Surgery. She's a thought leader in minimally invasive surgery and adoption of novel surgical techniques. And owing to her unique expertise, we'll be discussing with us developing fundraising strategies for collaborative projects with industry. With that being said, thank you so much, Dr. Ross, and I turn it over to you. Good evening. Let me just... Uh... Are you able to uh, see the slides? Yes. Wonderful. Yes, well, that's great. It's uh, truly a pleasure to uh, be here this evening and uh, discuss really how to develop relationship with, between industry and surgeons um, on behalf of the SSAT. So in my, in, in my view, in my opinion, there are five really uh, important relationships that I see professionally. Uh, from my perspective, the number one is a relationship of a surgeon with their patients, their staff, their administration, referring physicians. And the, 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 the last uh, one, which I think is very important is with industry. It's really part of what we do. The tools that we use uh, really rely on, on innovation coming from industry. And as surgeons, we should always strive to uh, grow. And, and uh, with growth, there is change. And if we truly like to grow and change, it has to be with embracing technology. And so when it comes to partnership, um, uh, the, the really the key players are the surgeons, us, and industry but it has to be a beneficial relationship uh, among the two. So what are some of the advantages? It's, it's quite obvious and making, uh, making sense that from the surgeon's point of view, access to new technology is really uh, incredible. It can enhance your, your practice. It can improve your patient's outcomes and really increase your productivity. When it comes to um, uh, the ideal relationship between industry and uh, uh, surgeons, what the surgeon can give is, is, is a great deal to industry from a real world operational uh, insights, like the, the companies uh, that come up with a device, they can really put it in the surgeon's hands, which they cannot, the engineers cannot do that. They don't have the, the patience. They don't, they cannot take the device to the operating room, try to use it. It's our experience. It's our operations. It's our expertise that gives them a lot of insight into their innovation. And from industry, um, the way we benefit is really getting a lot of disruptive uh, technology that can uh, impact our practice. But what's really important is how do we make sure that surgeons are getting the right benefit from this relationship? In other words, we tend to really give away a lot of our um, uh, IP, uh, and I'll, talk, I'll mention that in, in, in a second. We have to make sure that this benefits both parties, both industry and the surgeons. And sometimes we just don't know how to do it and what should we ask. So remember, we help with uh, recommendation on design, 
um, how to really use the, 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 the instruments, give feedback of when to use it. Well, they gave, give us the cutting edge uh, technology that we can access, uh, be trained on new technology and be really in the forefront of surgical advancement. IP, IP is really, really important because we are very quick to give that away. Uh, when we see it and, and with industry and we sign a contract, so they want our opinion, their, their, our opinion uh, regarding their device, their new device. And if we are giving an, uh, an opinion about their device, that's okay. They, you sign a contract, you get the money for it. However, if you at any moment start to think that you, have, you can change the device to make it better, or make it to form a, a, a different improved uh, device, you really should stop and, and ask to sign a different contract, which will be like a design, uh, a device design contract where you they, they are going to give you royalty or something for the, or if it's a, even if it's a co-inventor, but something more than what uh, they're, they're willing to give with the regular contract. So that is important to know. If you have a completely new device, like you you saw something and suddenly you say, like, wow, I have a completely something something different that is a whole new device, then you definitely want to stop or not share. Um, you know, get uh, file a patent and have uh, then approach the different companies and ask them uh, to sign an NDA before you do anything else uh, or, or tell them about anything. So, so in other words, surgeons really have to know how to better, the industry is not gonna come and tell you, whoa, stop right there. We're, we're, you're telling us too much. They're just gonna do it. And especially when you work with big companies, they're more likely they have all the, the, the uh, support, they can make it themselves. So just as surgeons, we, we need to be a little bit more sophisticated to be able to protect ourselves and really gain as much as we can with, with new ideas, especially uh, from industry. But it's really a new relationship that comes together. It's so beneficial. The journey is incredible. And the benefit to overall patient's care is enormous. Really, the industry is the motivating uh, force for all innovation. And so we need industry. Industry makes our life easier. They bring us the technology that allows us to do same operations much easier with shorter length of stay, better outcomes for our patients. It's, it's truly amazing. And we need to embrace that. But there are six different major types of relationships that I want to bring uh, to, to everyone's attention. And just and there's not, nothing to worry, no, no surprises there, but just to be aware. Uh, the first one is CME, which we all know, then the literature that we develop with industry that we need to be careful on. Uh, supporting local and outside speaking, uh, uh, proctoring and mentoring engagements, that relationship that we can have with industry, as well as sponsoring, consulting, design agreements. Uh, and that's all more true in the past that uh, industry will give a lot of gifts and send you to different, uh, to travel different places, which is not medically related. Uh, and I don't see that much uh, at all now, but it used to exist everywhere. And finally, promoting surgeons as innovators uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, events, which is very, very uh, nice to, to hear, and we hear it more and more. So starting with uh, CME, it is great. Um, doing a CME, what's most important is really you're asking industry to uh, assist and, and support it, but you can't be biased. You can't mention their devices, right? But they can have different parts. So if you put an event, they can have uh, it during the break, they can have their names and their support. And there's many different ways to, to uh, support back industry when they support your events. Uh, Non-CME uh, credit in within the same event is important. I personally benefited from uh, having my passion is really helping women in surgery. It's a symposium that uh, started back in 2009. And uh, now we're celebrating the 14th year. It's just uh, they were all developed to encourage uh, young women to choose a career in surgery. Uh, and those that chose a career in surgery to help them excel by bringing leaders in surgery, uh, women surgeons, to help each other over an entire weekend. It's not uh, an association, it's not a society, doesn't have members. So I'm completely relying on industry support. Without industry support, this doesn't exist. And, and what it is, it's it really, uh, the audience is all from pre-med, from now is even high school, 
uh, students, but pre-med to medical school residents, uh, fellows, uh, junior attending, and all the way to experience att attending and leaders in uh, leader surgeons uh, that all support each other. But once again, none of this could have happened for the past 14 years now without the support of the different societies. And every year it's different. And so, but th that's completely based on industry relationships. And those relationships happen because business is so personal. I can't even stress this, that enough. Business is very personal. Uh, the next thing is literature. Being involved with industry and literature is really, I mean, it, it's great, but you have to be really careful and watch everything that is written. You have to check it. You need to make sure it's based on facts and and, and that there's no bias to it. And uh, authorships needs to be accordingly uh, set. And so there are a lot of rules that you want to be aware of. When it comes to speaking and proctoring and mentoring, remember industry wants the relationship with you as a surgeon. They, they look for somebody that's really busy, busy clinician, because the more you do, the more they know that they, you're going to be wanting and to embrace technology and interested in doing new things. Uh, if you're the kind that kind of like you're set, you, you don't embrace change because you're like feeling comfortable with what you are. Personally, I really think surgery is constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. If you feel that, there's, that you've reached it you, you, the, the, at the top, you don't need any change. I really think it's time to retire, but that's just me. I really think that surgery is a continuous growth and, and, and change. And so industry looks for exactly those kind of surgeons that are opinionated, but in a good, you know, have opinion wanting to build something to help together build something and that can improve the, the, the care in the operating room and after. Uh, they want somebody that is busy, like I mentioned before, and somebody that is willing to develop that kind of relationship to lead that can lead to better innovation and so um all you need to show is is that you're interested and once you you're interested and wants to show them that there's a good uh, uh uh productive relationship they'll come after you you won't even have to search for them when it comes my my personal uh, uh experience with intuitive intuitive the robotic surgery it really transformed my entire practice. Uh, everything that I learned in residency, I don't do today. All my foregut, esophagectomy, gastrectomies, whipples, uh, distals, uh, uh, extra hepatic recycling, everything I do is robotics. And so when I, I, I was introduced to this technology and embraced it, then I was like, okay, how can I make it? I, I, I love to engage with the engineers. And so I develop relationship with Intuitive uh, as an expert uh, in helping uh, developing uh, the, the different uh, uh, products. Uh, working is uh, networking with other physicians. Uh, from Intuitive, I get all access to cutting edge technology, which I, I, which I love. Uh, fellowship uh, uh, support, um, getting all with platforms with other physicians uh, for educational uh, proctoring, anything that you all you need to show is that you're interested and that you want to do it uh, to champion uh, industry initiatives and diversity uh, of our projects, uh, serving as ambassadors and educating surgeons outside inside the country and outside the country. And uh, having limitless opportunities uh, to work with with the engineers. If you have something, some discomfort in the or some something that you want to change, the stapler is not working. Something is 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 or you have the opportunity to make a difference. To let them know, those are the people that can make your or and life uh, in the or much much easier. So being proactive and being uh, involved is is worthwhile. Support, uh, you get support for initiatives. Like for me, it was for women in surgery. I'm really passionate about that. And I want to help as many women surgeons as I can. And it provides you some great resources. Uh, consulting agreement, remember, this is very beneficial to both parties. Like I mentioned before about IP, but really it's, you get exposed to new technology and they gain from you. What is your opinion about their device? How can they make it better? while remembering what you need to remember as a surgeon. So things to be aware of. Really, you need to know when you're working with industry, what are the policies in the corporation that you work with? And if there are some policies, 
make sure that they don't interfere with one another. The last uh, story that I, I would mention with in in my institution, I I, I really love and and passionate about the SP. Uh, the single port uh, robot, and so I uh, developed an IRB with in my uh, hospital and uh, an IDE with the FDA, and now I'm ready to to do something that I know is going to be very unbiased, very by the book, and and I would can rely on the results. This is one way that I think is the easiest to do it right. It takes a little bit more time, but I think it's important working with industry that you do it right. Um from the perspective of getting presents and 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 uh, travels and all that that's very very important to not accept gifts necessarily and uh and and, and really not to, to stay by the book because your reputation is on the line and if you want people to listen to your opinion you got to stay clean and so i wouldn't um it's not moving now i wouldn't um um participate in something like that and finally um, as an innovator with industry, there's a, a great uh, innovators uh, surgeons that uh, uh, that I know that I'm so proud to be uh, part of their uh, um, life and, and experience and uh, innovative uh, uh, capabilities. And, and as a surgeon that is an innovator, you have great opportunities when you have a relationship with industry to sign the right contract and make sure that you have the appropriate things like the patent, the NDA that they have to sign before you uh, share your opinion, your, your idea, uh, make sure that you get all the benefits that you should be getting. And from an industry uh, point of view, they have only benefits uh, and something to gain with your uh, um, ideas and uh, uh, innovation. Um, really, a relationship with industry, in my point of view, is is a win-win relationship. I mean, you can't go go wrong. I mean, it all depends on you, how involved you want to be. And um, the sky's the limit. I mean, working together with engineers and good companies, it, it's it's truly amazing. So uh, do it. If you have any questions, um, contact us. We would love to help. And really, I encourage everyone to be involved and, and really improve the overall innovation in the operating room. And therefore, I believe would improve patients' outcomes. Thank you very much. In conclusion, this, as I mentioned before, industry is, is truly a conduit to technology. The relationship is what promised us to have advanced, good advancement in the field of surgery. And remember, while you're doing all of that, maintain and uphold professional integrity and in patient care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ross. That was phenomenal. Um, if for sake of time, we'll keep moving with our next talk uh, and we'll address the questions at the end. Our next speaker is Dr. Pryor, who will be discussing strategies for successful industry partnerships and device development. Uh, Dr. Aurora Pryor serves as Surgeon in Chief at Long Island Jewish Medical Center and System Director uh, for Bariatric Surgery at Northwell Health, where her practice focuses on bariatric upper GI and hernia surgery. Dr. Pryor was the 2019 to 2020 president of the SAGES, and she has also served as SAGES treasurer, finance chair, membership chair, and research and career development chair, among other roles. She's an active leader in several national societies, including the American Board of Surgery, American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and American College of Surgeons. Her current research efforts focus on advancing laparoscopic bariatric and GI surgical techniques and outcomes, and relevant to today's discussion, new technology in surgery. Dr. Pryor, you may have the floor. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Pooja, and I really appreciate the invitation to speak with all of you today. I'm actually gonna pivot a little bit and change my topic. It's not just strategies for successful industry partnerships and device development, I'm gonna focus more specifically on the device development portion. Um, and then at the end, talk a little bit about how that can pivot to relationships with industry. Um, these are my disclosures. So like Sharona, I have found it very valuable to work with industry. And I think there's a lot of really nice symbiotic ways you can do that. Um, so this is nothing to be ashamed about. I think this is something that as long as you are open about it can be fruitful on both sides. What I'm going to give you a little bit of background about is what I have done with device development. So when I was a junior faculty member, 
um, at Duke, my mentor actually left the organization. And when he left, he said, hey, I've been working with this device company on a new device for bariatric surgery. Do you want to work with them? And I thought, how cool is that? Um, so I went and partnered with this new startup company called Barosense for a implant at the GE Junction or thereabouts um, that could be an internal restrictor, sort of like a, a lab band. Obviously, none of you have heard of this because the device um, failed its FDA trial, but I learned a lot about how that works and I learned a lot about people. Um, and this was actually a really fun way to kind of get my foot in the door. Uh, I'd had a background in engineering and this let me kind of use some of that and got me excited about surgical innovation. What happened next is that same group of people said, hey, we'd love to come up with a new device for natural orifice surgery. So this was the time when notes was really exciting and, and new. Um, and so we actually had a retreat for a weekend and sat down and I said, well, you know, notes is a big first step. Let's do single port as something that I thought was a little more palatable to most general surgeons, but divine a platform that could actually be engineered further to become a device for notes. So it was me as a laparoscopic surgeon, a cardiologist who talked about catheter-based technology, and we combined the two in this platform called Spider, um, which was a single port instrument delivery extended reach, maybe a little stretch on a name, but um, was really cool to kind of take this from this concept through the engineering, through FDA approval, um, and actually, this was even exchanged on the New York Stock Exchange, um, which was really pretty awesome to be a part of. Um, with that, we had this single port platform. We had flexible instruments and some proprietary instruments that were um, rigid or rigid with joints. Um, Trains and Terex decided to take a turn and, and to join the foray into robotics and um, actually invented, based on that same platform, a single port robot which unfortunately did not make it through the FDA, which really hurt the company dramatically. Um, they then bought a separate robotics company from Europe called Senhance, which I think is still available on the market, but um, it's been a challenge to compete with Intuitive. So um, it was very interesting to learn successes and potential failures. I luckily sold my stock before we got all the way to the Point it is now, and it actually paid for some of my college education for my kids, which was great. Um, since then, I've worked on new invention disclosures, patent applications. I got an NIH grant um, for some new technology, which was pretty awesome. Um, we had a device that made it through the Sage's Shark Tank as a finalist last year, and we've started a new um, technology company, which is very young, um, called Surgical Props, working on um, devices for um, general surgery or laparoscopy. All of these things work because when you come up with an idea, you're looking for something that is missing in the puzzle of surgery, and you're coming up with a way to do something better than it's done today. And so that's how you have to think of these things and think about how they fit. So to do that, you really need to think about the problem. Um, this is some of the early single port surgery where people were not actually using one port. It was single incision surgery um, with multiple trocars thrown in. Sharona and I both spent a lot of time um, trying to figure out these procedures and they were definitely awkward. So this was the problem we were working on. Spider, um, could we do this better? Um, looking at all the options I think is really important. So say you were inventing a surgical stapler you have to look at what else is out there and you want to make sure you write all those things down when you're talking about what your invention is because things come along like the tri-stapler, like a change that can completely get around a patent that somebody has and you want to make sure there's as little space as possible outside your device. So kind of think wild when you come up with an idea about how else could the same thing be done. And honestly, some of this is really important to me because we invented the single port robot um, and Intuitive was gonna buy Transenteryx and they walked away on the day they were supposed to close and that's when they invented their single port robot device. So I'm a little bitter about that because I could have been actually very wealthy if that had gone through. Um, next thing is looking at the market size. So as you're coming up with an idea, 
one of my earliest inventions was a way to help facilitate retroperitoneal pancreatic debridement, which is done so rarely in practice that it made no sense for any company to want to invest in this device. It would have been pretty cool. It could have been a, a better thing, but there was just no market. So as you look at something, the business plan does matter. And you're going to hear a little bit more of this from Dr. Duffy, but look at the number of cases, how many of those cases might use your device. And that gives you your potential volume that you're going to be using this device on. And then come up with some basic ideas. What's your device going to cost to make? Is, what's the profit going to be? And you're going to have to look at sales and all kinds of other things you'll hear more about. But if the business doesn't make sense, it's a bad idea and it's a waste of your time. If you can make money, then it's a good idea and it's something worth going forward. Then you've got to look at what else is out there and why your idea is better. So compare what they have, look through the patent and trademark office. Um, Google's actually got an even better patent search thing on Google patents, but you know this is a little bit of the paranoia of the big brother of the internet. Be careful what you put down because then Google knows what you're looking for. So um, don't disclose unless you're ready to disclose. Um, also think about when you have an idea, how it's going to get through. And the FDA has pretty clear processes depending on how invasive your idea is, which class one medical devices are really straightforward. 510K is a process if there's anything that you consider a predicate device that you're just doing an iterative change on something else that has been approved. Um, or you could actually have a pretty aggressive market pathway if you have something that is completely brand new. Spider, for instance, even though it was a very complex system, um, actually used Trocar as a predicate device so we could go through 510K. Class one are super low risk things like gloves or things that are not put in a patient, things that don't have to show sterility. And those things are really easy to get through. Um, so this is a little overwhelming. And if you have a business background or an engineering background, this may not be so um, difficult to consider how to move forward. But what I would recommend, if you have an idea, figure out what help you need. Do you need help doing research and development? Do you need help with surveys for a needs assessment? Do you need somebody who's got the business hat? And figure out who those partners is. For any of you in academics, you may not have a choice about who your partners are. And many institutions have a golden handcuff that if you come up with an idea while you're their employee, they own that idea. They may have people who can help you on campus. They may have money that can help you on campus. Um, but you definitely have to understand your institution rules before you talk to anybody outside. Um, so these are some of the things that I've had to work with in my career. Um, I started out at Duke. Duke gets a minimum of 10% of royalties if Duke resources are used for any invention. Um, then beyond that, Duke de deducts any direct expenses that includes the patent process, anything else. So as soon as you sign that license, they take all that out. Um, the inventor gets 50% of the first 500000 in royalties plus up to 10% of that first 500,000 to their lab, which is pretty great. Um, but there's different ways that this can work out. And the number that you get usually goes down as you make more and more money. Um, Stony Brook um, reviews all inventions and then they can say go or no go. I actually found they were extremely painful to work with, which now that I'm not there, I can say. Um, they still have not decided on something I invented about five years ago, and it's stuck in this black hole of their Office of Licensing and Transfer, which is just crazy. Um, so you, I would recommend in the future, and if I had to work with Stony Brook again, I would really get in paper what their timeline is going to be. Um, but their deal beyond that is relatively similar um, to the Duke deal. Um, but now that I'm actually working on a license with Stony Brook, I learned that they shift a lot of these expenses as, as anybody in finance can do. And they put things so that they get extra monies up front 
that will never make it to the inventor side of these equations. This is from a Medical College of Wisconsin showing how that tech transfer process works at an institution. Um, when you disclose, you then usually have a meeting um, with that licensing office. They'll evaluate. I really wish Stony Brook had this four week cap, but Wisconsin does. Um, and then they'll do the patent. And there's usually two steps to that. Um, there's a provisional patent, um, which is good for a year. And then you have to put your official patent in and that whole prosecution can take three to five years. Long discussion about other things to consider in this, but as soon as you have that patent application submitted, it is your idea, and you can take a device to market. Um, you can get a license either for yourself as the inventor or another company can, and then you can start looking at research and development sales, or you can even look at... Um, selling your idea um, to a company or selling your company to a bigger company. Um, but that time process takes about five to 20 years um, moving forward. In general, for a company to buy you, they want to show that you have success in sales. If you sell before that time point, um, you're going to have much less return on your investment and potential sales price. So if you've gone through that, if my institution had said, no, I'm not interested, or somehow you have a deal, like at Duke, if I didn't use any resources, I could spend one day a week on outside inventions, which is how Transenterics came to be. Um, but if you have some workaround, then you could look at outside partners and inventing or working outside of your institution. And as Sharona mentioned, Number one thing, and there are so many surgeons I have seen screw this up. So if you remember nothing else from this webinar, remember non-disclosure. Sign an agreement before you tell anybody about your ideas. It protects you a lot. Um, the other thing that can work is if you if you file that provisional patent, that actually is probably even better um, that a non-disclosure, but like I learned with Intuitive, they were able to figure out after they saw all of our patents, they figured a way around our patents. So none of these things are completely perfect. Once you go out and decide to talk to industry, you've protected yourself, you're under NDA, you have a provisional or further patent. Uh, many of these companies have arms that work for consideration of new technologies. Some even have official portals online, but it always helps to have a handshake and a meeting, um, usually very separate than the sales arm, but your sales arm people can often introduce you to the correct people for the new tech. Um, submit to that, you'll have discussions, but you're essentially gonna have to pitch what your device is which is you talk about the need, you talk about your product and the, the niche space that it fills, and you talk about your potential revenues and, and um, you know, competition analysis. And so it's a pretty standard deck. If you guys have watched Shark Tank, you understand how this works. But these companies will purchase products or license products that add to what their portfolio is. But you definitely want to make sure it makes sense that their sales reps are the right people um, and it, it fits in their, their portfolio of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you. I hope that's helpful. And if you remember nothing else, non-disclosure and patent before you give your ideas away. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Pryor. That was an outstanding discussion. Um, I'm going to turn things over to our last speaker, Dr. Duffy. Um, I want to take one second to um, remind everyone that they can um, type chat questions into the Q&A box, and uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Um, Katon, and I will get to those at the end um, for discussion. So um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Andrew Duffy. He is a minimally invasive surgeon at Yale, Associate Surgical Chief of the Digestive Health Service Line, and the Medical Director of the Hernia Center for Yale New Haven Health System. His practice focuses on minimally invasive surgery of the abdomen and GI tract, including laparoscopic and robotic techniques techniques, encompassing bariatrics, hernia repair, reflux dysmotility disorders, and more. He has a long history in surgical education, including program director for the Yale General Surgery Residency and director of the Yale Surgical Skills and Simulation Center. 
He's also leveraged grant funding for education research through industry, and we are excited to hear his perspective on developing a business plan and financial budget. With that, Dr. Duffy, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. I uh, <clears throat> I appreciate the forum and the audience, and I've maybe taken a slightly different uh, take on this uh, than my uh, than the previous speakers, which is probably uh, part of the part of the point of this discussion. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of my experience, uh, particularly with several different areas. This is probably the first time that my talk has been totally focused around my disclosure slide rather than rushing through it. Uh, and I, I put this in red because sometimes these disclosures and, uh, can be viewed as a little bit of a scarlet letter. And to uh, Sharona's point earlier, it's important, I think, to disclose these and to, to remain cognizant of uh, how this is perceived and how it may impact your other core missions like patient care or education. These are some of the roles that I have right now. It's evolved over the years. I'm on a couple of medical advisory boards. I'm a consultant for Medtronic and Intuitive. I've done some work with BARD on a research uh, study safety board uh, with them. And you know, one of the ways I manage my conflicts of interest here is to be talking about similar uh, issues with two two different companies in the same market, which kind of distributes my uh, my bias a little bit. Um, but Every company seems to have something that they can offer, and there's often opportunities, and uh, it's fun to get involved. I'm you know, a pretty busy clinical surgeon, particularly for an academic surgeon and a residency program director, now heavily into robotics. And it's probably not a coincidence that we've got three minimally invasive surgeons on here because we're all frustrated engineers on some level, or maybe in the case of uh, Dr. Pryor, not so frustrated. Um, but you know, the technology we use, the insights we have certainly have value, and it applies to the teaching work that we try to do. These are some of the administrative roles that, that I have. I'm involved in our clinical governance committee, which oversees a lot of supply chain decisions and contracts, which directly uh, impacts a lot of uh, medical devices in the space that I work. The MPC is the Northeast Purchasing Coalition, which is a regional consortium that uh, works on shared buying power for supply chain and requires medical advice to help inform uh, the business folks. Um, I'm also uh, currently the interim residency program director here at Yale as one of the larger residencies in, in the country. We have uh, um, 73 residents in the program currently. Uh, I'm also an associate fellowship director for our MIS fellowship, and I'm a member, member of our robotic steering committee. And you can see a lot of these things have potential conflicts with some of the uh, companies that I've been aligned with. And it is important to disclose these and talk about them freely, and I do in all of those roles. And sometimes that impacts the leadership role in those particular committees, uh, but it does, um, it does provide... Um, the opportunities to express some of the things that I've learned from being on both sides of this. This is, this is kind of how I break down some potential collaborations between industry and academic surgeons. Some of this is personal. You can be consulting advisory boards, working on device development, you know, developing your NDAs like uh, Dr. Pryor was mentioning. Uh, but some of these relationships become because the hospital, the health system asks you to get involved with something they're considering because they have collaborations on their own level. Some of it may be through the university or the medical school specifically on maybe larger uh, pro projects that they need your expertise for part of it. Some of it's at the request of your chair or other members of your department. Some of it is specifically related to academic research. Um, whether it be on new procedures or, or techniques or, or potentially new devices. Some of it may be related to educational opportunities for residents and fellows uh, where industry may have uh, the ability to provide opportunities that may be hard to get otherwise. And I've, I've got some angles on all of these things, uh, which kind of keeps it interesting because the, the balances are different in each of these. And the conflict of interest policies can vary. Uh, our hospital and university are separate entities. The hospital actually has a more restrictive conflict of interest policy, just to confuse things as a residency program director who works for the university. My residents all work for the hospital, so we're playing under different sets of rules. Um, the hospital will not accept industry grants or gifts, and the university is generally extremely happy to, as long as there's appropriate uh, taxation added on to it for, for administration. The university is generally incentivized by academic potential. Uh, and looks at the overall funding, including looking for sources of uh, indirect cost uh, funding, which I think runs around 55% these days in most major universities. 
And as was mentioned uh, in the prior talk, university ownership of discoveries, um, Yale has about a 30% uh, share back to the inventor um, with actually the rest of the money going back to the school or department or lab. Um, but it's still a relatively small percentage versus someone who's developing a device independent of a university. And we have a VA, VA hospital, which brings federal rules in, into play. And that may have a, a different impact on depending on the allocation of the faculty and the resources um, and where the, the, the funding is coming from. So my early experience in getting involved in industry was as a fellow. Um, and we, my uh, mentor at the time was approached regarding a new style of uh, composite mesh product from a European company that was trying to get data to support US market entry. So they clearly had an incentive from that uh, perspective. And they were also looking to increase their company value and probably set themselves up for, for a sale. Now, I was the fellow, so I didn't have any sort of stake in that. Uh, I was at Cornell Medical School at the time, and we had appropriate facilities to do animal survival studies. We had pathologists willing to be involved with, with you know, electron microscopes and other technology, and we had the veterinary uh, staff to help take care of the animals in a survival study. Um, we had a group of surgeons, and me by default as a fellow, being interested in supporting new materials for laparoscopic hernia repair and looking at new fixation technologies. We were looking you know, for funding for our research and for publications and a better understanding of technology that was available. Um, and this was back around the time when most of the mesh available had some, some version of Gore-Tex uh, or PTFE attached to it. Um, and we were looking for, for better solutions. So those are the questions we're looking to answer. This was fully funded by the company. Um, there was a mutual agreement on the protocol. Um, so we made sure it had scientific value, but also uh, potentially would answer the questions that the company was looking for. We got it formally IRB approved. In this, in this case, the device was FDA approved, which made that part a lot easier, although we weren't doing human studies. The budget was developed with the university, and this was probably one of the hardest parts. They were requiring indirect and overhead costs it was a lengthy process. It was driven primarily by university charges, including the cost of uh, animal husbandry and, and other uh, factors that I hadn't even thought about when we were developing the budget for this. Um, industry generally doesn't want to contribute the salary cost for the physicians involved. Um, and, but, you know, and we, as academicians, don't want a corporate role in data analysis and publication, which is usually a, re a requirement uh, for, for the university and for a lot of publications, uh, which makes a lot of sense uh, from that perspective. This is the paper that came out of it. It's, it's not quite a nature paper, but it was an interesting paper from that perspective and with some pretty interesting images here looking at different uh, types of uh, mesh integration in an animal model. And one of the things that jumped out at me is you can see the delamination here between the PTFE and the, the native tissue here um, with polyester and polypropylene fibers, both on the H and E views and the uh, and the, 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 the electron microscopy views. So what, what did I take from this? Well, part of this uh, that when I moved to my current job at Yale uh, a year later, I decided that those composite meshes were not a mesh that should be supported. Uh, at our institution, and we never put them in, but I, I must admit I've spent a lot of time taking these out over the last uh, 50 to 20 years um, and have seen that some of the suppositions we made from our animal study are probably quite correct in this. This obviously, the paper did provide some marketing for our sponsor, and it did allow them some entry into the U.S. market, and they were bought by a larger company, so they certainly got um, their their value out of it, and I learned some, uh, some, some information that I've made, uh, made uh, part of my career and it, it uh, a little tongue in cheek here, but I guess it inspired a career in managing mesh complications. So this is how, how you get started in such things. Uh, but understanding how the mesh works and doesn't work, which was one of the lessons I got from this study, was quite helpful for me. And it was I wouldn't have had that opportunity. It wasn't funded. That was mentioned during the introduction that I was the director of the, the simulation center here at Yale. In fact, I established it. And this is just a quick screenshot of what our simulation protocol looks like. And we have a lot of the tools that a lot of other programs have. Uh, and these things are expensive. And you can see that we've got some notations on here from some different companies that we, we partner with because they have some of the tools that we don't necessarily want to develop ourselves. So if we think the educational value is there and we decide that this is a useful tool, we try to integrate that uh, into the curriculum. We originally established this lab um, 
with departmental support, which doesn't mean a whole lot for, because other than the fact they gave us space, which is, does have a premium at, at all institutions, but the actual cash to, to set things up and buy the equipment, do the renovations came from industry gifts. Um, and this was a collaborative project where we actually approached several different industry partners who, who shared this all looking for equal billing on, on the plaque on the door and the recognition for, for their role. They donated equipment and supplies. Um, this was handled as a gift for the department through the university. We were able to negotiate in this case uh, out of the overhead costs. Um, these kind of single time gifts though, don't necessarily cover ongoing maintenance or warranty costs. So we worked that into the, the upfront equipment cost to help get that worked through by the uh, by the grants um, and uh, get it for properly supported so we can maintain the equipment. And this led to other arrangements where we're coordinating with uh, companies over wet labs and simulated tissue labs and who may have more resources than we necessarily do. Um, they can provide uh, sponsorship for these and sites to do the work. Um, our, again, our relationship uh, with the hospital university is a little bit complicated. These kind of on-site labs are not allowed under the hospital rules, and we have limited space at the medical school, which puts us in a little bit of a, of a bind. Um, in addition, because the residents are hospital employees, travel may not be reimbursed or meals or lodging. Um, but by university rules, it's okay as long as it's got a clear education goals and program design and led by our faculty. So working in between, we can run these, these labs uh, fairly locally and not with overnight stays and make sure we're achieving our education goals. Um, the, the corporate corporation goal here obviously is to, uh, is to expose more surgeons to their brand and devices. And you know, the hope is that if you get a resident familiar with a the device, they may teach the faculty about it and get them to use it. Our goal is really getting people's hands on equipment, learning how to fire some of those staplers you saw on some of the earlier slides so that the first time you get their hand on it is not in the operating room. And then get an opportunity to practice hernia repairs and things like that in wet labs uh, so that in the operating room, there's more opportunity to work on the finer points uh, of these cases. And this all ties in with some of the modern minimally invasive practice tools we use, whether it be implant materials or, or ro robots with teaching consoles or endoscopic tools. And you know a lot has changed in the last four years. A lot of us were working from home for a little while. Um, we certainly rethought how we deliver care in ambulatory surgery centers and moving robots around and realizing that there's a lot of data available through some of this new technology, which has value in both standardizing how we uh, develop uh, uh, clinical programs and we can focus on cost efficiency, even in the space of robotics and on teaching uh, details and then use real data to measure how we're doing and collaborate with other services. And the data is available and it's inside these devices or it's available through, through the companies and access to that data and learning how to interpret it has a huge value, particularly in a, in a teaching program. And you can get interesting clinical data out of it here where I, I can show some, some data from a couple of years ago where we showed that doing robotic uh, bariatric surgery actually reduced length of stay and had a higher contribution margin versus some laparoscopic procedures. Not exactly what we expected to see necessarily, um, but it, the data does inform some of the decisions we made uh, and it impacted how we handled some supply chain decisions. So um, this, this data was actually handed to us from the company who did some work with us uh, on some of our own uh, EMR data. And the company like Intuitive is really the only robot company available to us right now. It does have a lot of data that can inform how we teach in cases and how we pass uh, instruments back and forward. And it's given me some ideas on how to track and score more objectively how trainees are doing and how to track, like in this paper, the difference between an expert and a novice on a console and how to work on in simulation and make the performance of the novice more like the expert uh, and then bring that back uh, to the patient. Um, I'm working on a project right now, um, which is a work in progress. The company also obviously has strong self-interest in proving that their data collection techniques have significant value. In fact, it's a, it's a product on the market and it's quite expensive. And it's expensive enough that our hospital, again, separate entities are not really interested in uh, purchasing it right now. And this, we already have the robots, but the upfront cost is pretty significant uh, and uh, for adding on to the equipment. There's also some data analysis costs for any studies we do that can be managed in the department, but we have some 
internal funding mechanisms that can help handle that part of it. But we do need access to the technology and proprietary software that's available to help us make the most out of this data, where hopefully we can turn this around for research purposes, in both improving the value of our uh, training programs, but also in theory, this should prove the value of the device and services and it's really delivering uh, what they're looking for. So, you know, my, my take home message from, from this is that the, the most uh, productive relationships are really where you have aligned interests. It's really important, you've heard this from the other speakers, to have clear expectations and boundaries. And a lot of that comes down to the agreements that you're signed and making sure we're talking about the same thing and balancing out the interests on both sides. The budgeting really needs to, to, to fit the needs of the project. And there may be different mechanisms of doing this and trying to negotiate the complex rules of uh, how it gets handled in your institution can be a bit of a challenge. Overhead can be negotiable depending on the nature of the gift. And there's, uh, there's some you know, ways of working uh, through that. Uh, but definitely be aware of unaligned conflict of interest policies between institutions and be clear with the relationships and keep your academic goals uh, up front. And I think there's a lot of benefit uh, to us and our training programs and research efforts uh, work, working this way. Well, thank you for your time. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Duffy. That was an excellent uh, presentation and summary of all the work you've been doing. Um, it was really, really impressive. Um, so uh, by my um, time over here, uh, we have about eight minutes. Um, I'll try to keep us on time. We have three questions in the chat. Um, I do want to try to get to all of them. Um, so thank everyone for attending. Uh, the first is from Elsie Jacob. So this question pertains to uh, mission trips. So um, and I'll kind of open this up to all three of our panelists. Um, have you ever um, experienced a partnership with industry such that they've um, provided equipment for either mission trips or um, providing equipment? I guess it could, all, it could also maybe even apply to, you know, it sounds like some, some in some ways to your like, research initiatives. Um, how have you sort of interacted with industry to um, garner equipment for those types of purposes? I, I guess I can take that. Um, I've not done it specifically for mission trips, but I've done it for simulation labs for residents or other educational activities. And most of the time you reach out to companies that you work with. So I do think these relationships, as you've heard repeatedly tonight, can be very, very helpful for other things that you want to accomplish. And so having a friendly, open relationship, the companies want to help you. They're not opposed to these things. And they will give you equipment for projects. There's maybe a cap. They've got a limited budget. But these are things that they want to do and um, ask. I think all the, the, what that is important is for them and for you to show them you're serious. In other words, nobody wants to spend money if you're just going to try it and then kind of like go about your, your business. And so I think showing them that you're consistent, you 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 have a whole plan, uh, a project that is written, that if it's an IRB that is required, you do that that way. It's just when they can trust you, they will invest in you. Great. We have another question. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Duffy, were you saying something? Oh, I was just going to say the one thing you run into with this kind of thing sometimes is that the companies have their own fiscal years that don't necessarily align with ours. So sometimes we put requests in relatively late, but they're, it may be out of their budget cycle. So these are things to think about ahead of time for these kind of donations. Uh, it depends a bit, uh, too, on what the use is going to be. You know, there are expiration rules on, on um, disposable products in the U.S. that may not necessarily apply for donated materials. It certainly doesn't for a training lab. Um, and the companies probably get write-offs for some of this stuff. Um, so they're usually pretty collaborative on it. But if you stay kind of ahead of it and ask plenty, uh, with plenty of time in advance, you'll, you'll find that you may have uh, better luck getting it. Great. I, this talk has been phenomenal. I mean, I, I cannot stress how important it is for all surgeons to leverage into industry in this day and age. And I really liked how you all three integrated your subjects and matter amongst each other and, and went from all the way from developing an idea to protecting your idea and then having actionable items. Um, I, I have a, a, my own question, but I'll reserve it till the end. One, uh, Dr. Yang asked, Andy Yang asked a question about how to collaborate on research if anybody has any ideas, how what's the appropriate approach 
to the industry and uh, ask for discount to their product for testing. This gets to a little bit about what I was talking about. And part of the challenge for us is our, our hospital who buys most of the medical equipment is not going to accept a, a discount or a gift in, under most circumstances. Um, if you already have a relationship with the, with the company, there's a way to work it into existing contracts, at least on a trial level. Um, um, there, Like I said, there may be some other workarounds on this, but that can be a challenge. Um, so thinking about where the product, who's actually going to be paying for the product if they were going to buy it, is is part of that and figuring out what, what the most manageable way is to get a hold of it. It's going to be very different depending on the cost involved of, say, a disposal device versus some capital equipment, uh, obviously, and it would be handled differently. So the, these are kind of, from my end, they've all uh, handled individually. We do have a mechanism for... Uh, proposing trials of devices that fit an unmet need or, or may provide a cost benefit in care and can propose a study uh, where there are institution will actually pay for the device at market rate for a limited period of time. So it depends on what you're using as to how useful that approach may be. There's something to think about if you want to try out a new type of suture or something like that, but having defined uh, you know, endpoints uh, for a study that you can then bring back to leadership and say, hey, we, we tried this device. This is what we saw. Maybe it's worth negotiating a contract on this or working it into our, our purchasing uh, uh, strategy. And also many companies actually have a grant process online or a research application online mm -hmm. where they'll give funding for things in certain areas. So you should look for that. I can give an example for what I personally, like I mentioned, for the SP uh, I wanted to apply it to foregut and HPB operations, and uh, uh, Intuitive cannot do that um, because it's not FDA approved. So I had to go to uh, fill up an IDE mm -hmm. uh, application in order to approve that. And then I was able to uh, get their support with an IDE and then did an IRB, uh, again, just to... Um, make sure that everything is by the book. Mm -hmm. And then they supported it 100% and helped us uh, get the SP. Great, and our last question is uh, from Dr. Sajid Khan, who is the chair of our research committee and was uh, pivotal in getting this set up. Um, and then he's addressing Dr. Pryor, Dr. Ross. Uh, once a surgeon develops a mature model, uh, um, a novel device or idea in collaboration with industry, can they take that idea and transfer it to another university if the surgeon is moving? Uh, or are you tied to the original university where it originated from? So when you disclose an idea to the university, that starts the process of getting that idea to patent. And then the university that you started it with will own the patent. That said, if you want to start a company and pursue it, um, then you can license potentially from the institution that you got the patent with. That is a completely acceptable way. If it's something that will be licensed to somebody else, you can then um, potentially work with them. Or if you want to invent new ideas, that can be the next step. That's fine. Um, but you, it definitely it has an anchor on where it was invented. Now, collaborations or other ideas, those things are portable. Great. Um, for sake of time, we are at four o'clock on, or at least that, and the on the hour uh, on the dot. So, if anybody has any burning last minute questions, uh, please feel free to ask. But this has been phenomenal. Thank you, Dr. Villano, for setting this up as well. And we can't thank enough uh, to our uh, administrator, Dr. Uh, Miss Beverly, who's also on the line. Thanks yeah. for having us, and thanks for getting up in the middle of the night, Pooja. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you.